Good morning, everyone. I'm Robin Steinhorn. Uh, I'm uh, Vice Dean for Children's Clinical Services at uh, UC San Diego, and I'm thrilled uh, to be here co-hosting this uh, from Rady Children's uh, and UCSD. Um, our topic today is near and dear to my heart uh, on uh, the effect of COVID on children. Uh, and this is part of our six week series that is running every Wednesday through August 26. At the end of the presentations, we want you to join the discussion and submit your questions through the Mentimeter. Um, you can see the website there and the code is listed on the YouTube. Um, these symposiums are all live streamed uh, through the YouTube channel, the UCSD uh, YouTube channel, and they'll be posted after that. I'm really excited to be here today with uh, my co-hosts, uh, uh, Chris Longhurst, our Associate uh, Chief Medical Officer and Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at UCSD, uh, and uh, Dr. Chip Schooley, uh, who's an Infectious Disease Specialist also at UCSD. And you can see where website where you'll find more uh, information. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Longhurst to introduce our two really great speakers today. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Steinhorn. It's a pleasure to be here today. And it's a particular pleasure for me to get to introduce one of my uh, former attendings and mentors from uh, Stanford University, Dr. Yvonne Bonnie Maldonado, uh, before going off to Johns Hopkins to do her residency in pediatrics and her fellowship in infectious disease. And then before returning to Stanford, she went to Atlanta, Georgia, where she uh, completed a uh, fellowship at the Center for Disease Control in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. So uh, one might say that Bonnie has been preparing for this her, her whole life. And I say on a personal note that uh, Bonnie was a real inspiration and role model for me while I was at Stanford. So it's a real pleasure to have you here today, Bonnie. Thank you very much for joining us. And joining her today will be Dr. Uh, Catherine Edwards, uh, better known as Kathy, who's professor of pediatrics and the Sarah Sell and Cornelius Vanderbilt chair. Uh, she is the scientific director of the Vanderbilt Vaccine Research Program. She's had 40 illustrious years at Vanderbilt, has been responsible for the development of Vanderbilt's vaccine research program, uh, the premier vaccine research program in the country, and someone who I have the, the uh, opportunity to work with every day uh, as the pediatrics editor for clinical infectious diseases. She's personally handled uh, more manuscripts than any of the other associate editors because she handled all the vaccine manuscripts, all the influenza manuscripts, and all the COVID manuscripts uh, related to pediatrics. So be delighted to hear from her about her perspective uh, about um, COVID and pediatrics. So without further ado, we're gonna hand this over to Dr. Maldonado who will be uh, giving us a short talk and then we'll be uh, switching over to Dr. Edwards for a short talk and leaving plenty of time for uh, questions and answers at the end. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Chris and Chip and Robin for uh, this uh, lovely opportunity to uh, share what we all uh, have learned so far about this virus. And as we all know, uh, around the corner, there will be another nugget of information. So uh, tomorrow is a new day and we'll see what we know then. But I'm going to give you a brief update on some of the work that has been done around the world. And I am gonna highlight just a tiny bit of work that we're doing here in my uh, research at Stanford as an infectious disease epidemiologist. So um, uh, let me see if I can advance here. There we go. So I'm gonna briefly in uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we'll go over briefly mechanisms of transmission because that's always an important topic even when we talk about children. Epi, uh, the epidemiology in children, household transmission, and then just touching on back to school because I know there's going to be hopefully we'll have time for questions. So I really want to highlight this issue because it's a very contentious issue in the literature. And I will have to say, as I'm a little intimidated because I have two editors and associate editors of these journal articles here um, listening, but I will say that this particular article, which by the way, is written by an environmental engineer really uh, talks about addressing airborne transmission. And I won't go into the details. You can see the slides later, but their idea is to appeal to the medical community to in, in, inform the issue of airborne spread. But then if you read further on, they really talk about the way the disease is transmitted in a way that we as epidemiologists understand to be respiratory transmission and not aerosol transmission. So they're 
is an epidemiologic difference in how uh, viruses can be spread in both manners. And this virus follows the epidemiology of respiratory transmission. So uh, JAMA published a separate article shortly the, after the other, where they uh, talk about demonstrating that speaking and coughing can generate aerosols. And that is absolutely true, but these are really respiratory based transmission routes. That is droplets, whatever size they are, which move from one person to another. And a lot of the epidemiologic characteristics, including a lower R naught of 2.5 really indicate that this is primarily a disease that's transmitted through droplets affecting uh, transmission of mucous membranes of the face, eyes, and nose from one person to another. And so at the end, that this is the take home here is that masks are highly effective and the balance of currently available evidence suggests that long range aerosol transmission is not the dominant mode, although aerosol generating procedures are clearly important and need to be a prevented, uh, exposure needs to be prevented there. And here is very good evidence, um, although I would never recommend that this happen in real life. Um, uh, there was a paper that was put out by this MMWR CDC about two uh, symptomatic hairdressers who were PCR positive, who worked for a number of days and exposed about 140 customers. Of those customers, uh, about half agreed to be tested, but all agreed to talk about their own disease uh, status and none of them were symptomatic. Uh, half of the people did agree to be tested and there were no PCR positive. In fact, there were no PCR positives, no secondary cases were identified, but everybody was wearing masks and the average time of exposure was about 20 to 25 minutes. So this goes to show you that we know that even if you are around um, infection, which we as healthcare workers are doing all the time, that if you are wearing proper PPE, um, you will, your risk of transmission is incredibly low. Again, pointing to respiratory transmission and the fact that these simple mechanisms work. Now, let's talk about children um, and transmission because there it, the waters get a little murkier, um, but uh, we, there was a paper that was, uh, came out in Origin Infectious Diseases recently looking at contact tracing during coronavirus disease outbreaks in South Korea involving 50,000 people uh, who were index cases, who were contacts of index cases in South Korea for a period of time. And what there was done here, and I'm sorry, this is a busy slide, but what they did in this paper was break down the, the index cases by age and the contact uh, household transmission uh, rates by uh, household transmission and non-household transmission cases by age. And you can see here that the zero to nine year olds were least likely of any age group to transmit within a household, uh, but the 10 to 19 year olds were the one of the highest groups likely to transmit within households. Um, overall, household transmission, and this is true worldwide so far, that household transmission or correlates of that, such as uh, dense packing plants or factories, which simulate household type exposures, are the primary drivers of transmission. And in all age groups, non-household transmission was actually relatively low for all age groups. So we don't really know why this occurs, that younger, yeah, older children appear to have higher rates of household transmission. I will say that a, a one limitation of the study is they did not look at asymptomatic transmission. So it's possible that there were more asymptomatic transmissions across all the age groups, and that may have reflected the difference in percent positivity here. So this is very different from what we see in seasonal influenza when the highest secondary attack rate virtually um, really is highest in children and that children who attend daycare and school tend to be at highest risk for transmitting other respiratory viruses to household members. Um, and that is not what has been seen so far in the vast majority of the literature published around children. Although as we know, most school and daycare situations have really been truncated because of shutdowns due to the pandemic. So we'll have to see more. And indeed we are conducting as many others are household uh, opening uh, transmission studies here at Stanford and elsewhere. Now, this is a study that just came out last week as well, which again flies in the face what, uh, of potentially of what we just talked about, although it's not clear um, how this will affect epidemiology, but this is a paper from 
uh, Lurie Children's Hospital in, uh, in Chicago, looking at uh, about 50 or so children of varying ages and their viral loads during the time of their symptomatic infection. And you can see here, this slide is a little confusing because it's CT value of the PCR. So unfortunately, this actually the lower CT value indicates higher viral load. So really think about this as higher viral load, the lower you go. And you can see that children under five are statistically more likely in this study with small numbers to have higher viral loads than uh, children, older, older children and adults with symptoms. And these were all children within people within a week of symptom onset. So we don't really know what this means in terms of transmission capacity. We just know that this one study has demonstrated higher levels of virus in the nasopharynx of these children. And we obviously need to learn more about the dynamics of, of viral load and uh, risk of transmission and mechanisms that have to do with age. So um, I wanted to highlight some work from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, as we have look, seen, and many of you know, there are no uh, collated data on pediatric um, COVID from a federal standpoint or from any other national standpoint. For, so early in July, the American Academy of Pediatric went into the databases of 49 states and territories, including uh, Washington, DC, and pulled all of the data from each of those websites and co collated it for all of us to see. And it's on their website at aap.org. And I would encourage all of you who want to see more pediatric data to go to that website. So they um, looked at um, states reporting on hospitalization and mortality, but they really recommended that more states continue to provide detailed reports on pediatric uh, cases, hospitalizations, and mortality. Now, the findings here show that these are numbers of cases that they found, and the darker the color, the more the cases. These were not uh, adjusted for population. So in general, larger states such as Florida uh, and California may have higher numbers of cases, uh, but this is not a rate-based calculation. And then finally, their overall findings were that about 7.6% of all reported cases or 200,000 cases total in children under 18 were reported um, in all of these 49 states and these and other uh, um, territories of the US with an overall rate of 279 cases per 100,000 children. Um, between uh, about one to 10% of all hospitalizations were pediatric hospitalizations and zero to 0.2% 0 of all child cases resulted in death. So overall, we are seeing nationally that the rates of in hospitalization are low and the rates of death are extremely low. Um, I'll talk a bit about a study that I'm doing here at Stanford. And what we're looking at is a prospective study of COVID positive outpatients seen in the emergency department and their household members who are agreeing to provide a daily anterior nasal swab for 21 days or until shedding ceases. So far, we have 18 households with 59 total participants. Um, we have recording symptom and shedding duration with date of self-reported symptom onset as day one. Mean symptom duration is 20 days and shedding duration is about 25 days. And you can see the range is wide, but those are very few outliers um, um, on the 60-day uh, range. This really represents only two people. We had six infected asymptomatic participants. Three of the participants were under 18. One was an index case under five was exposed at a daycare and there were two teenagers who were exposed at home by their index case. And this is just a brief summary. This data has, we're not complete. This is a unpublished data yet, but you can see that the index cases in the upper right um, were primarily skewed towards middle ages, um, 30 to 70, I guess that's a little more than middle age now, uh, but um, the middle age and older. Uh, many of these were caregivers uh, of, uh, of uh, other people or, uh, or had spouses who might have been infected. Um, and you can see that among the, um, the total PCR positives, children only made up 19% compared to up to 91% in older age groups. And among household contacts, 13% uh, of children were uh, positive compared to other age groups. And remember, we followed these families out for up to three weeks or longer in some cases, 
And all of the PCR positives were also antibody positive. All of the PCR negatives were a piece antibody negative. And that's, that's the date, data so far from our study, suggesting that um, in, at least in our population, household transmission may have been related to older adults, um, middle-aged older adults who are either spouses or caregivers of older individuals who were infected. Now around pregnancy, I wanna just briefly mention that about 33% of infected uh, pregnant women in New York uh, through universal screening were found to be asymptomatic, but among those who were symptomatic, uh, they represented fever, cough, and malaise were the highest uh, number of symptoms. And disease severity tended to reflect the general population, 86% with mild disease, 10% was severe as we've seen overall. Um, there are limited data regarding COVID-19 effects on pregnancy. And we have uh, recently granted some funds to our colleagues here at Stanford and PEDS and OBGYN to look at long-term outcomes of children who born to COVID infected women who the babies who themselves were not infected. But majority of data have not demonstrated increased risk of transmission or severe complications. Now there is a new CDC study in June that did look at this risk. And I apologize for the slide here, but basically what they did is they took um, uh, uh, over 90,000 women who were either pregnant or non-pregnant and they looked at outcomes and what they did found, find that there was appeared to be a five-fold increased risk of a, a adjusted risk ratio of hospitalizations among pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women, but and also a 1.3% adjusted risk ratio of ICU admissions but not deaths. Now, the problem with this data is that about 50% of the cases reported of these 90,000 had no data. So none of this data was available for most of the patients and they were not able to distinguish hospitalizations for um, uh, labor and delivery compared to hospitalizations for COVID disease. So it's very hard to know whether this truly reflects increased uh, risk. And I think ACOG is still uh, uh, under, uh, trying to develop, develop uh, additional policies around what to do around pregnancy and potential risks. Another study in the UK demonstrated that older age and uh, black or other minority group uh, had a higher risk of, um, of uh, COVID infection. And we see that that's obviously been true here in the US as well. But perinatal outcomes have demonstrated no initial reports of vertical transmission in selected studies. In, in general, the data have not indicated that children in newborns are at higher risk of infection, or if they do become infected, uh, no, uh, it appears that there is a very little to no risk of uh, serious disease. There have been symptomatic newborns, but those have uh, been, um, resolved within a few weeks and have been discharged to home uh, with good health. Um, and then the data around California come from a large uh, statewide uh, data set that monitors all neonatal experiences. And so far, uh, only a handful of pregnant postpartum uh, women have been admitted with COVID-19. Several second and third trimester cases were intubated but have re recovered and discharged uh, and still pregnant. Um, and the rate of positive tests among asymptomatic pregnant women across California is about one and a half percent so far. So um, we're talking about when will we get back to normal? Uh, proposed interventions, I won't go into details, we can talk about these later, but many of the interventions will be based on a number of assumptions. And I think these are really bearing true as we move forward, that the disease will be circulating at an unknown rate for some unknown time even after stage reductions in community containment, that a vaccine will not be available for several months or longer, that we should have rapid testing um, available uh, for high throughput monitoring for new infections, possible reinfections, and more importantly, for surveillance and contact tracing, and that we must continue to enforce behavioral mitigation strategies, although those may be incompletely su su uh, successful. So uh, non-behavioral, strategies may be able to limit spread of disease and that we have uh, access to hospitalization uh, capacity in all of our um, co uh, communities. And so I'll end uh, briefly by saying that the American Academy of Pediatrics has, uh, I think, undergone a bit of um, 
controversy because they came out with a statement uh, saying that they strongly advocate that the goal should be to have students physically present in school, but they did say this should happen with careful measures to keep students and staff safe. And I'll also say that the AAP mentioned, put this statement out before we saw this bigger surge happen, although the general principles are still the same. They point out the important social, emotional, um, and physical uh, and mental health uh, supports that these in-school op opportunities have for many children and do address racial and social inequities for many, many families. And so that school and public health leaders must get together to understand how to stage return to school. Um, and their emphasis is that at this time, as far as we understand, children may be less likely, especially young children, may be less likely to spread infection. Um, and then finally, to uh, talk about the fact that it's important that the school environment is safe for all in the building, including physical distancing, face club coverings, frequent hand washing and, and frequent cleaning. And uh, we must be nimble and flexible around school opening, school closures, using staggered or hybrid um, uh, re-entry and uh, monitoring of symptoms among everybody coming back to school. And I will, and re reopening uh, must uh, uh, be formulated in a way that maximizes safety above all, and then learning and well-being of children. And I absolutely want to emphasize that children absolutely, whether they're in person at school or not, must be up to date on all vaccines. We have seen up to 80% reductions in uh, childhood vaccinations over this period of time. Those numbers are getting better, but we do not want to see outbreaks of other diseases as well as uh, in this pandemic. And so I'd love to uh, hand this over to my colleague, uh, uh, Kathy Edwards at this time. Thank you so much for your attention. Kathy, you're on mute. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me go backward. Uh, let's see, could I go to my first slide? Let's see here. Um, there we go. Thank you. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, and thank you, Chip, for your nice introduction. And, and uh, hello to my friends in, in San Diego. So I'm going to talk to you about the clinical manifestations of COVID-19 in children. I want to go over first um, the data that came to us from China. Um, and this is a paper that reviewed early on uh, around 2,000 cases of COVID in children. And I think that, that a couple points that, that uh, Bonnie made already is that uh, it does seem to be a little bit more uh, uh, common in slightly older children, as you can see here. Uh, but what is so remarkable about this respiratory virus um, that children have never seen before is that the severity of the illness is so mild. And in this paper, 4% of the children were asymptomatic. Um, and uh, the bulk of the children uh, had really mild, moderate disease. Severe disease was distinctly uncommon. And, and so this was reassuring to all of us. And then in April, uh, the first paper, and actually, as Bonnie said, really the largest uh, and the last paper from, from the CDC to talk about pediatric COVID is shown here. And I think the other point that has been so amazing is that the symptoms and the severity in pediatrics um, are, and adults are, are quite different. Um, fever, cough, or shortness of breath is seen in children, but not as commonly as in adults. Fever is also less common than in adults, as is cough, shortness of breath, myalgias, um, and all of the other symptoms. Uh, children just are not as uh, symptomatically impacted. It also shows um, what Bonnie was highlighting that by and large, most of the children are managed and can be successfully managed um, as outpatients and are not hospitalized. Um, sometimes they are hospitalized, but rarely are they admitted to the intensive care unit. And I think the other factor here is that it does seem that the ho that hospitalizations um, are somewhat more common in the children less than one and in individuals over 10 years of age. 
in a paper that appeared um, in May uh, summarizing all the intensive care unit uh, uh, data from around 48 intensive care units in the United States and um, in, in Canada only reported on 48 children who were admitted to the intensive care unit. And of all of those children uh, throughout the United States and Canada, there was only a 4% mortality. It was noted also, as I mentioned before, that slightly more children uh, in the older age group were admitted between the 11 to 21 year uh, age group, that respiratory symptoms were the most common. And quite remarkably, most all of the patients that were admitted to the intensive care unit had underlying comorbidities. Only 13% of the, or 17% of the patients had none. Many were medically complex with genetic difficulties or developmental delays, immunosuppression or malignancy, and obesity and diabetes were major players. And we have certainly seen that at our medical center as well. We also know that early on, uh, many children would present uh, in the first couple months of life simply as febrile neonates. And, and this sort of shows uh, a, a study that was done in Chicago at, at Lurie Children's in children less than 90 days of age. And 83% of them went to the emergency room, only half of them uh, were actually hospitalized, but many of them presented simply with fever. And I think it's also remarkable if you notice that none of them were hypoxic. So again, the benign nature of this infection, even in the littlest children, was quite remarkable. So we were really um, feeling a little bit comfortable about all of this, um, although comfort is always uh, uh, a difficult situation, particularly when, you, when we were faced with um, the European reports in the areas where high disease was occurring of Kawasaki-like syndrome. These were uh, happen these children had a SARS-CoV-2 related multisystem inflammation. This particular year, these European reports were primarily affecting healthy children. The mean age was about 10 years. Many of them presented with significant lethargy and irritability that many of them had Kawasaki-like syndromes in that bulbar conjunctivitis was seen commonly, red and cracked lips, cervical and uh, uh, mesenteric lymphadenitis, and skin rash was noted. Neurologic manifestations were seen, um, as was respiratory, but significant uh, left ventricular dysfunction and shock was a part and parcel of many of these reports. And the digestive symptoms and abdominal pain were, were really prominent uh, and indeed quite distinct from what had, had been seen in children um, that did not have this syndrome. In the uh, four initial papers that came out from, from Europe, you'll see a couple things. One is, as I mentioned before in the earlier slide, that the mean age was around eight, um, that there uh, were uh, a, a, a not significant comorbidities in most of the patients, as I had showed you to be in contrast with the COVID-19 admissions. And again, the remarkable GI mucocutaneous uh, uh, symptoms as hypotension and uh, uh, shock were really part and parcel of this. It was also noted that a number of these children uh, in Europe were, were of uh, 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 black uh, ethnicity and racial uh, uh, groups. When one looked in these European studies, you'll see that in contrast to uh, what we see with Kawasaki, where there are high platelet counts, most of these other than in the French report did not show that. Marked inflammation with elevated CRPs, uh, procalcitonins, uh, dysfunction in cardiac uh, uh, troponins and, and pro-BNPs, uh, D-dimers, very high ferritins and IL-1s, and evidence either of positive PCRs for COVID or antibody positivity suggesting a link with COVID-19. 
And in addition, echo findings were quite remarkable in that left disc, uh, uh, ventricular dysfunction was part and parcel of the syndrome. Uh, mitral valve regurgitation was seen and the coronary artery uh, abnormalities that are much common, uh, very, very common in the Kawasaki were less common with this uh, uh, syndrome as well. So a CDC case definition of this multi-system inflama multi inflammatory syndrome in children or MISC were that the age was less than 21 years, fever for less than 24 hours, clinically severe illness requiring hospitalization with multi-system organ involvement, laboratory evidence of inflammation, evidence of infection with SARS-CoV-2, either by a positive PCR, antibody, or prior exposure, and no alternative plausible diagnosis. I think it is important um, to, to contrast the Kawasaki with MISC. Also, it's a little bit like uh, bringing coals to Newcastle when I talk about Kawasaki uh, in San Diego with Jane Byrne. So hopefully if Jane is on the call, she'll correct any of my inadequacies or misspeakings. But, but in general, the differences between Kawasaki and MISC um, are usually the age is, is younger in Kawasaki and between eight to, eight to 11 in MISC, that Kawasaki rarely has accompanying shock, whereas shock and GI manifestations are really part and parcel of MISC. The cardiac findings in Kawasaki are rarely myocarditis and cardiac dysfunction, whereas MISC, that is very commonly seen. Um, and the laboratory findings in Kawasaki lymphopenia is quite rare, and usually thrombocytosis is seen, but MISC um, is, is uh, uh, highlighted by lymphopenia, thrombo. Uh, uh, thrombocytopenia or normal platelet counts with very high ferritin and other uh, uh, abnormalities associated with infection. A, uh, a manuscript recently appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at MISC ch in children and adults. Much of these uh, cases, many of these cases were reported from uh, New York and Michigan and New Jersey. Um, these were a whole, a total of 168 patients. Um, and the peak incidence of MISC occurred when the, uh, when the COVID-19 activity was decreased. Of these patients, 70% were positive uh, for PCR, for, for uh, COVID-19 or antibody testing, and the other 30% had epidemiologic links to confirm COVID. The median age of these patients was very comparable to what was seen in the European reports as being 8.3 years. 82% were seen in males, 73% had, pre had previously been healthy. Overall, 20% were in non-Hispanic uh, whites, 75% were in Hispanics and 30 uh, were non-Hispanic blacks, and 31% were in Hispanics or Latinos, with other racial groups uh, less common. As you can see here from these two slides, the temporal relationship between the COVID activity on the left, which is shown in the tan, um, uh, is, is demonstrated uh, peaking in April. However, the peak of the cases of MISC was about uh, three to four weeks after uh, and peaking in the May time period. And this again, as I had mentioned before, um, these uh, cases were mostly taken from New York, New Jersey, and Michigan. Like we had seen from the earlier data from, from Europe, the median age is, is of these patients is shown here. The race and ethnic groups I think is interesting and, and does appear to be more, uh, more common in Black and Hispanics. Um, and even in this case, appears to be disproportionately higher than was seen in the distribution of adults in that population. So suggesting that there may be some enhancement in those population groups for this, uh, this issue. Almost all had been previously healthy. 
Um, many, if I had to be uh, uh, admitted to the intensive care unit, and again, this is in contrast from the data I had shown you earlier. Um, and fortunately, almost all of the children lived um, and with prompt supportive therapy and, uh, and, and presser support and, and myocardial support, uh, most of them uh, lived. However, there were four uh, uh, there were four deaths uh, in all of the patients as shown here. In an excellent uh, editorial that appeared uh, in the New England Journal that was written by Michael Levin, who was one of the investigators um, in London who initially described this entity, um, he said, and again, I hope that you agree that there is a consistent clinical picture that is emerging that MISC is occurring two to four weeks after infection with the COVID-19, that the disorder is uncommon um, uh, in less than uh, two per 100,000 as compared to the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, that is being diagnosed in, in younger people uh, in, in less than 21 years of age, about, about 322 per 100,000. Most with MISC have antibodies to COVID um, and the virus is detected in a small proportion and a relatively high proportion of the cases have occurred in Black, Hispanic, or South Asian persons. I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about pathophysiology because that's actually what I find the most interesting at all of all. And this is a manuscript that was recently uh, uh, presented um, and uh, from the, the Emory group. And it looks at the antibodies um, in children that have had various kinds of, of, uh, of entities. The first column is MISC and the samples are, sizes are small, but the N is 10. The next is 10 individuals with COVID-19, but not MISC. The next is five individuals with Kawasaki. And as you can see here, the ages, as we talked about in this, in this population, are markedly different in the MISC and the COVID and the Kawasaki. Again, that the underlying conditions are very uncommon with MISC, um, and they are more common with COVID and uncommon with Kawasaki. The gastrointestinal manifestations are, are important, although some seen in Kawasaki as well. The white count and the lymphocyte counts are much less in the MISC patients. And if you look at the uh, to the right, you'll see that the RDB or the receptor binding domain on the spike protein in the children that have MISC um, are shown in green. And they're significantly higher than you see with the COVID patients and obviously much higher than the Kawasaki or hospital controls. So suggesting that, that, that the antibody titers are much higher in addition, if you look at functional antibody um, to neutralizing the actual virus in, in panel C on the right, you'll see again that the MISC patients have much higher levels. And also, which quite <clears throat> interesting is that there is a, a very good correlation between the SED rate and the actual receptor binding domain uh, IgG endpoint. So suggesting that those indeed are related. Um, and the final slide um, in another study from, from uh, Europe uh, from Italians that is, is looking at um, uh, differences in, in terms of, of, of these various populations with, with, uh, smaller, with smaller sample sizes for MISC. And these, this paper uh, looks at a systems biology approach, which, um, which uh, is, is also an interesting, but again, showing that there are differences that, uh, in this as well. Um, and finally, the conclusions that in general, children are rarely affected by COVID-19, less than 2% of the people younger than 18 um, are hospitalized. Most cases are asymptomatic or mild. Multisystem inflammatory disease is characterized by persistent fever um, and shock-like symptoms that it often requires intensive care and heightened awareness is important. Um, and thank you so much for your attention and we'd be delighted to answer any questions. Well, thank you uh, very much <laughs> to both of our speakers today. Um, I want to uh, remind those that are uh, watching live that uh, you can ask questions on menti.com. Uh, the code is on the screen there and is also available in the YouTube uh, uh, description. 
<clears throat> so um, without further ado, uh, we're getting questions pouring in and I'm gonna take uh, co-host privilege here to uh, go ahead and ask our uh, guests, Dr. Edwards and Dr. Maldonado, the, uh, the first question. So uh, imagine that you are a uh, health advisory committee member at a local elementary school here in San Diego. Um, and given the data that uh, you just uh, presented, I'm gonna synthesize that by saying that children under 10 are at particularly low risk and that uh, MISC is a particularly rare condition. Um, what are your recommendations for K through five elementary school? So uh, sort of the under 10 uh, um, group. What are your recommendations for the middle school and then what are your recommendations for the high school? And so I'll, I'll turn this back over to uh, both of you, uh, Drs. Edwards and Maldonado to, uh, to respond. So I can just say, I'll, I'll give my epidemiologic um, take on that. So uh, we are working with some of the local school districts. And as you know, we're seeing somewhat of a surge, although it's hard to say that because with the first surge never really went away um, as in California, but I think um, many schools are taking a staged approach and I agree with that because one of the areas I think that's most important is the preparation. Schools need to be ready to come back if they are, when they want to come back. So uh, for example, they need to be ready to have a teacher's mask, for sure all teachers must be masked. Um, I would recommend that children older than 10, given the data that we're seeing, need to be masked, uh, middle school and high school students. I think the question, and maybe Kathy can weigh on on the, this, what to do with the younger children? Should they be masked or not? CDC recommends children over two can be masked. My own personal experience as a mother of three kids, now adults, and a pediatrician is that that's not gonna be very easy. Um, but if people can get that done, then more power to them. But I would suggest that people working with younger children themselves are masked and um, we keep, I would recommend pods for, uh, you know, pods of kids and uh, distancing measures so that children are not crowded in rooms, which may re uh, relate to hybrid return to school. But the ma main thing is having the resources and the preparation necessary. So if people aren't ready to go back immediately to start off with a virtual staged approach and maybe having the teachers come back first so that they can get used to the new school classroom environments and then slowly stage in the kids. Many schools are also bringing children in, the younger children in first and then bringing in the older later. So, but again, it's gonna have to be a local decision and with public health involvement as well. So Kathy, I'll let you answer. Okay, um, well, this is obviously hard to answer and, and uh, um, it varies uh, certainly uh, in terms of numbers and, and uh, pre preparedness for sure. So I've been involved in these decisions as well. The um, Nashville uh, public schools have decided to go totally virtual. Um, and even though the plan was outlined, uh, which I thought was, was, you know, had a lot of the mitigation strategies and, and it was just uh, felt that it was too hard and we were actually having quite a lot of disease. So um, there will be a reassessment um, at, the, at Labor Day to see whether that's happening. But yesterday schools started virtually for all children. Um, in contrast, the, um, the Catholic schools have decided that they will all begin. Um, and so they've spent a lot of time uh, getting prepared and, and, uh, uh, and, and we've actually been doing some work with one of the schools where we're going to be doing some surveillance as well. Um, I think that, that the guidelines for those schools will be that all children um, that are coming to school will wear masks. Um, I did talk with Ben Cowling, my friend in Hong Kong, um, about masks. And he said that the children in Hong Kong, um, you know, know that that's part of their, uh, their, their garb. Um, and every influenza season, they wear it like their backpack. So I'm sort of a tough love kind of person. So I just said, you know, this is what kids need to do. And, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, just go forward, making sure that they do it. So that's kind of what's happening uh, in that regard. We will be looking very closely for, uh, for, for illness and, and also there's going to be a lot of attention paid to what kids do outside of school. And uh, there will be uh, a lot of discussion about, you know, it's not okay to, to go and, and play 
whatever with all of your friends, uh, but then come to school and be quarant or be, um, you know, use social mitigation. So I think we'll see, it's going to be an experiment, um, I think, and, and as long as we collect data, I think it, and make sure that we do it as safely as possible with as rigid of, of, of mitigation um, that is in available, I think we'll just have to see what happens. But Kathy, you uh, said that there was gonna be some uh, viral monitoring in the Catholic schools. Uh, in Nashville. Um, both of you made the case that younger children don't have as much symptomatic disease. If we're going to open schools, should there be uh, more structured uh, viral uh, surveillance going forward in terms of waiting, uh, not waiting for teachers to show up in the ICUs? Yeah. Well, I think what we're doing, obviously, this is not, um, it's its expensive. What we had hoped to do in one system was just, do, we would do, you know, that there's a nurse and we were going to do all the culture or all the PCRs and perform them and get them back, you know, the next day and do all the, and, you know, and we were also going to be doing asymptomatic screening and, and all of this. And then it became, you know, apparent that even the school that has 350 people, that this would be really expensive for us to do all these things. So what we're going to be doing is is that, that the testing will be done in the usual channels, although we generally can get it turned around in a day. Um, but we will be doing um, screening every two weeks and, and, ace, and for all of the people that are asymptomatic. And we won't give them the information real time because that also is another problem because if we do it in the research lab, then it has to be done in a CLIA lab to make sure that it's positive. So, so we're going to be focusing on the one area and then we will be calling and finding out other exposures as well, um, but but that's kind of what the plan is. It'll be done in one school, and and uh, uh, and hopefully we will not have much disease, uh, but we'll have to see. So we we are going to be doing daily uh, weekly testing of teachers and students in our CLIA lab, um, and it is not cheap. So I would not recommend you do this across the board. Um, I think university settings are going to be very different because you have much more. The numbers are much higher. And you have much more intensive exposure and congregate living. So there, I think uh, uh, universities have put a lot more effort into testing on a regular basis. In some of the CLIA lab cost differential is artificial. Um, and um, I mean, the real cost of doing a, a test in a CLIA lab is not $100. That's what uh, was negotiated with the Trump administration uh, during a period of time they needed more testing done. And we need to be honest about what it should really cost. It should be a commodity. So, I, so there are a lot of data now looking at modeling of testing, and it turns out that the type of test you use is almost not important. So you could use a cheap, orderly sensitive test. The more important issue is how often you test, and more importantly, what the turnaround time is. So if you get a cheap test that you can do, but you don't get your results back for two or three days, then the impact on transmissions is extremely low. So I just found out that um, the Yale saliva test, I found out this morning, may actually be um, approved for EUA this week with potentially a CLIA waiver. And if that's potentially available, I would suggest that could be used more in a university setting. I would certainly not recommend that for schools because I think the degree of exposure in children's schools as opposed to universities is gonna be much different and, and I think better controlled. No, I agree with you totally about the less sensitive tests. I just think we shouldn't let CLIA costs talk us out of trying to do any monitoring at all, which is what yeah. was happening for a long time. Yeah. Okay, another question that's come up that I think would be uh, particularly suited to Kathy has to do with some of the discussions about whether vaccinations for other diseases uh, can reduce the likelihood of becoming infected with COVID-2, particularly BCG and polio virus vaccines. You've done a lot of um, thinking in that area in other settings. Any thoughts about that? Um, I think that that has been proposed, um, and and I think that if you look at um, you know a number of, of studies that have been done in Africa and looked at look at children after immunization campaigns with with polio or with BCG, you'll look you'll see that there is a real real impact on reducing mortality in those children. Um, however, I think that that um, we have no evidence that that this is actually happening currently. Um, I think we have no evidence with this new virus that it indeed would work. Um, and I think that that um, thinking about a past um, immunization with this and, and uh, it would, would be hard for me to see how it would work. So um, I think that 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 I would be less uh, encouraged about that and and uh, and think that that uh, 
uh, I would would not think that that would supplant a vaccine and and uh, uh, as well. And and certainly Bonnie's worked a lot with polio, so she may have some thoughts as well. Yeah, so there, there currently is a, on a, a, a South African or it's an Australian based BCG trial now. It's a multinational trial yeah. to look at evidence of reduction of COVID disease. Uh, one of our investigators here at Stanford, Jay Sanders, is involved with that trial. Um, I, we are actually talking about this with um, Kasia Chumakov at FDA because I've worked with them for many years and Bob Gallo. But again, as Kathy said, I don't see any evidence for this. We are doing a statewide um, medical record review. I have access to 35 years of California hospitalization data. And we're trying to look at pre and post OPV to see if the, uh, uh, we can see redu any reductions in infectious disease hospitalizations over time. And so we're in the middle of doing that analysis because it's probably half a million records. I'm sorry, half a billion records actually because it's a long period of time. And if we see any kind of a signal, at least that might give you some indication because really there are no data to support that claim. And as Kathy said, I'm not quite sure what the mechanism would be either. To tack on a, uh, another question to this uh, interesting vaccine discussion. So, so thank you for plugging the importance of vaccines in children, where we're seeing uh, we're seeing um, delays in in our region, as I know you are in both of yours as well. As we think about a COVID vaccine coming um, on the market, which is going to induce an antibody response, do we need to worry about that antibody response triggering an MISC-like syndrome in kids? That is always the question that um, whenever I talk about vac using vaccines in children, um, there is a protocol that's being written by the um, NIH for use in children um, and actually is almost finished. Uh, when it will begin is a question. Um, and I think that has been raised. Um, you know, is there something specific about these MIC children? You know, is there something about their environment or their genetics or, or whatever? And, um, and I think that that, that you know, obviously has to be a, a concern. Um, I think it's really important that we get fundamental knowledge about what is happening with MISC, you know, what is the, what, what actually is the immune response? How is it aberrant? And, and so I think that's really, really important. Um, and the, the trials in children would begin with the very oldest, um, uh, although you say, well, maybe that's a child who has more uh, MISC and not the little ones um, and would have to be done very carefully. Um, some feel that it should wait until we have efficacy data from, um, you know, from the from the ongoing studies before we do that. Other people do not. And so this will be, you know, this will be a discussion. We actually had a very lengthy discussion about this yesterday on a call about uh, uh, and so I think that 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 it's a hard question. Hopefully, you know, I, uh, that some understanding of pathogenesis will will be helpful. It would need to be done in a very careful way, and and um, and I think the decision how it goes forward will need to be weighed uh, by a number of different people. But I think everyone has that has expressed that concern. We talked about vaccines at our faculty meeting on Monday, um, and Dr. Weber, who is a cardiologist, was the first to ask the question, which is exactly like yours, Robin. So I think we're, we're all uh, thinking about it and, and hoping that we can answer it. And I talked a little bit about, you know, could we find an animal model? Because, you know, the non-human primates have been such great models for looking at enhanced disease. But I, I just thought, you know, if it happens less than 1%, we probably would have to use all the baby primates that existed and wouldn't still have, you know, a number to, to study. So I, I think that we need smart people thinking about how we can study it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple questions from our audience. Um, first one, is the high attack rate among children attending the Georgia YMCA camp inconsistent with other earlier data suggesting relatively low transmissibility among children? And then the second part of the question is, um, Israel reported a disaster with uh, increased COVID-19 when children went back to school. What did they do wrong? And I, I just read the Israel study last night and would note that that is of high school students, not elementary school students. Well, I can just say that both of those scenarios were all behavioral issues, all of it. So there are viral issues that we need to deal with and there are behavioral. And right now what we need to understand a lot more about the virus 
but we also need to understand human behavior. So in the first case with Georgia, while the school, the camps did say they had rules about masking, distancing, et cetera, they did not enforce those rules. And um, there were frequently children who were not masked um, and were not distanced. So that is very clearly the uh, route of exposure um, in that situation. And again, that leads to the same issue on universities around congregate living and why many of us at universities worry because you can, you know, how do you enforce these rules when you have people living together? Now, what most universities they're doing will be putting people in single rooms if they're bringing people back. And we hope that that'll keep them apart. And the only other motivation I can think of is to tell them, look, if we have X number of numbers of cases, then we will shut down school again and do it all virtual and everyone has to go home. So that was a behavioral issue. The issue in Israel was a little more complicated, but again, seemed to mirror the same thing, which is Israel thought they had beat the virus. And so they just opened up. They just totally opened up. People weren't wearing masks. They were going out. Um, it was in the school part of it. And it was all blamed on the schools, but it was really a societal issue because the schools started to open up. They didn't have any um, real uh, uh, crackdown on distancing and masking, et cetera, like they had before. And then in the communities, the same thing happened. So there was spread from schools elsewhere, but there was also a lot of societal uh, reduction in use of masking and et cetera, which I have to say happened in California too. So we, um, I think one of the issues is that we felt very confident about that. What we know about these, any virus, any infection, is that um, our, you know, viruses uh, follow very simple rules about r nots. So you just need one case in a community and within a few generations, depending on how many transmissions you have, you are gonna see hundreds of thousands of cases. And I think we just need to remember that um, unless you're, you have zero transmission, and this is a lesson I learned from polio, if you don't have everybody, uh, if, you have, if you, as long as you have one person infected in the community, there can be at risk for multiple infections. You now, as a, as a uh, teaser for next week, one of the things that Dr. Yuen will probably talk about is exactly that. Uh, they got very good control of um, this disease uh, in Hong Kong early on. And then in June began to loosen up a bit uh, and then uh, began to allow tourists and others to come in from other places where the virus uh, has been circulating to a greater degree. And they set off uh, an outbreak of hundreds of cases in a very short period of time because some of the things that had gotten them where they are, were were relaxed. Um, it does suggest uh, that we're going to be on a knife's edge uh, for quite a while uh, when we get things under control. Uh, if we have the will to do that in the U.S., uh, we're going to have to continue to keep these uh, mitigation uh, activities in, uh, in play until, until we have a vaccine, if we get a vaccine, because um, it's not just getting below the threshold to be able to reopen. We're going to be on a roller coaster if we keep going to 9.9% and then reopening and going to 15% and closing. It's, uh, it's, it's craziness. What, uh, what do you think we can do to motivate um, the other part of behavior you talked about, Dr. Maldonado, so eloquently is behavior of all of us. Uh, here in San Diego, uh, a lot of the uh, driving force of this virus uh, is people between 20 and 40. In, in fact, that's the plurality of cases right now, and most of it is social interactions, um, not at workplaces, but um, at beaches, parties, schools, uh, homes. Uh, when you look at outbreaks on college campuses, it's uh, parties uh, for the most part, the people who've come back so far, football team, parties. Uh, anesthesia residents in uh, in Florida parties. Um, any idea? You know, how how do we how do, can well, you be a party? It's all, about, it's all about risk perception, right? Because think about that age group and how uh, they we, how easy it is already to get them to behave. Think about how easy it is for us to tell people not to smoke, not to not to eat fatty foods, not to you know. So their risk perception is pretty spot on, actually, because they're saying, you know, I have an eighty percent chance of having no symptoms at all or very mild symptoms, why should I care? And that's the critical piece. The critical piece is get the message out that you might not get sick, but if you don't behave, we won't be able to let you have parties, you know, three or four years from now. Um, and 
the idea that we can actually, I'm at actually at the point now, we go out to eat in an open air areas. I went to the coast and we masked and we were really perfectly happy and safe um, at a hotel that was well cleaned, although I did clean it down myself as well. But um, I think we can open, we can have our cake and eat it too. We open up the economy slowly and build out these processes where people understand that this is not a hoax, number one, that it, we know how it transmits. And if we can get people to understand that if they behave and still can go out, as long as there's distancing, that they can have in the longer run within, uh, you know, within the next year, we should be able to see at least, if not vaccines, at least some preventive therapies, hopefully monoclonal antibodies, combination antivirals, whatever works, something to get um, people, pre uh, you know, prevent disease. And I think that's critical, that kind of messaging. And it needs to be consistent. That's the other problem is it's very regional. And as long as you have one county or one state, and not the next one, the virus will just move right in. And so, yes, I think we're all gonna have to get those messages out. Dr. Edwards, any final comments? No, I think that we as pediatricians, um, uh, we need to just remind people that if they don't behave, we can't get our kids educated. And uh, personally, I think the kids are the most important part of the society anyway. We've gotta get them educated and we gotta get them back to school. So do what you're supposed to. Thank you very much. Well, um, Dr. Schooley, I think you've earned a new moniker. You're the party pooper. I want to thank uh, Dr. Robin Steinhorn for helping uh, co-host today from Rady Children's Hospital. And I want to really thank Drs. Uh, Edwards and Maldonado for a compelling presentation. I have one final uh, question for, uh, for both of you, one word answers. Uh, here in San Diego, where our weather is uh, pretty terrific year round, uh, if you were reopening schools, would you have the kids inside or outside? Outside. <laughs> Outside. Outside. All right. You heard it here. Uh, hopefully my school board's uh, on the line. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, plug next week's uh, Grand Rounds. As Dr. Uh, Schooley mentioned, we have a uh, really exciting guest speaker from Hong Kong, Professor K.Y. Uh, Yuen. And K.Y. has got a really tremendous background, both on the science and the epidemiology side. Such uh, promises to be exciting. The week after that, uh, we'll have a view from the front line here at UC San Diego Health of some of the clinical and uh, scientific endeavors occurring. And uh, really looking forward to seeing you all soon. So thank you very much for joining today. Thank you again, doctors uh, Edwards and Maldonado. Really appreciate it.